Our next speaker is Dr. Parnandi. Dr. Parnandi is a PhD, or has his PhD, he's a, currently an assistant professor and director of the Lipid Signaling Lipidomics Laboratory at the Dorothy M. Davis Heart and Lung Research Institute of The Ohio State University. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Toledo and his po postdoctoral research at the University of Minnesota's Hormel Institute in Lipid Biochemistry and Oxidative Stress. He's a research faculty member at the John Hopkins University Pulmonary, Pulmonary Division where he conducted his research on vascular endothelial cell lipid signaling. Currently he focus on, focuses on the role of phospho phospholipases A2 and D in vascular dysfunction in lung diseases and environmental vascular toxicity. He has published more than 50 original papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Parnandi. It's an AGD disclaimer. I do not have any financial interest of a product in my talk or with any companies offering grant monies for this continuing dental and medical education program. Okay, I have, a, I have a problem I want to tell you. I, I don't speak English, neither I speak American, I speak in between. So I have an accent. If you, have, if you don't follow my talk, please ask me, I will repeat. And uh, my major interest is vascular biology. I'm a lipid biochemist. I work on membrane lipidology and the signaling of membrane lipids. And then I have been interested in vascular biology for more than a decade and a half. And we look into mostly cardiovascular disorders and vascular leak phenomenon and also angiogenesis relevant to cardiovascular diseases. And I originally when I started working on, on mercury, I was really not interested in mercury toxicity. The reason was I work with an arcane enzyme called phospholipase D where very few labs work on this enzyme in vascular tissues or vascular cells. And this, in, this enzyme is very interesting. It has a histidine group in the active site. And it, 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 it's a, just a fiction. Now, people thought that the histidine does the catalysis. And my inorganic chemistry background told me that if that is the case, transition metals like mercury should either activate or inhibit the enzyme. So we started working on mercury to see the effect on phospholipase D in vascular cells. And that's how, how I got interested in mercury. And then I started looking at it and found out that mercury is implicated in cardiovascular diseases. And just it is coming up. So I started work on what exactly does mercury at the membrane level. And that was the whole interest why I started working on mercury. And I am fortunate that I got into IOAMT. I'm very grateful to them for all kinds of support and encouragement, and also to give me a slot to give a lecture on my work at the 25th anniversary celebrations. Thank you very much. This is a periodic table. I call it a biological periodic table. Every element you find in Earth's crust is present in the human body. This is mostly, the, my interest is in the transition metals. And I actually worked on transition metals at the doctoral level on vanadium and vanadium and chromium with respect to oxidations in the biological systems at the membrane level. And the formation constants of, of these metals with the proteins are so tight and the order of magnitude is very high when you go to mercury, silver, and gold. Once these metals, like mercury, silver, and gold, bind to the biological targets like proteins, they won't come out of it. There will be an exchange, it's called a metal ligand exchange, but the binding is so tight, it's, it's uh, very difficult to get rid of the body. And once they bind on the target sites like enzymes, they do a havoc in the cell. And there comes the problem. Either they activate the enzyme or inhibit the enzyme. And since the DNA operation is entirely dependent upon enzymes, the synthesis of DNA or regulation, upregulation or downregulation of genes also dependent or dependent upon the enzyme activations. So the entire life is actually driven by catalysis. So enzymes are the most important ones. 
they regulate the, the system's function, and these transition metals, especially metals like mercury, attack those enzymes and modulate their, their functions. Yeah, thanks. This is what really bothers me. Actually, every time I give a talk on mercury, I show the slides of the kids. About 98% of energy allocation is towards reproductive success. Every one of us struggles to establish the copy of the double helix. That's what it is. So in other words, we have to be worried about the kids. And that's what's happening in developing countries or developed countries. Whatever it is, it's just a hierarchical separation. But where kids in, 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 in developing countries, including countries like India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, to clean lead batteries, when they clean lead batteries, and, and for the recycling purposes, they're exposed to these toxic heavy metals. And what happens? They're the metals of the mind. All these metals accumulate in the brain. Brain has the highest affinity for these metals. They accumulate. Ganther and Prohashka in University of Wisconsin, a long time ago, about 30 years ago, worked on these metallothionins. They're synthesized in the kidney, they're synthesized in the heart, liver, and brain. And once these metals go into the brain and bind, they will not come out. Detoxification of the metals from the brain is the most difficult one. How do you get rid of these metals from the brain? From any organ you can think of, you can detoxify them, you can remove them. But once they go into the brain, there is no way. I have never heard of reversal from, through blood brain barrier from the brain into the back to the detoxification system. It really bothers me. Just I wanted to show this slide. This is what the, lead, the levels of lead. But two years ago, or a year and a half ago, the New York Times reporter called me and asked me, oh, you work on mercury toxicity. I said, yeah, it's intellectual interest, so what do you want? And the question was, what is the safe level of mercury? How do you define a safe level? I'm a radiation biologist. How safe is the safe dose of a radiation? That is the rule. The same way, I'm not arrogant or I'm not, you know, making a, a, a comment on this, you know, without any sense. How safe is the dose of a toxic transitional heavy metal? So in my opinion, a dose that you can't even, you know, any dose that is not natural is not good for the body. It is detrimental. Anyway, these levels are for, you know, all these levels changing, you know, because of the federal regulations or governmental regulations, all these are for some, some other purposes. But when you consider as a, these levels as a scientist or a healthcare, you know, person, you've got to be very cautious about these, these concentrations. Once you see suddenly a raise from one nanogram to two or three nanograms, which are not natural, you've got to be careful. So that's what I wanted to emphasize showing this slide. Again, we got all these journals and, and magazines once in a while making a sensational thing, coming and showing the pictures of these again. This again bothers me, children. This one is, you all know, it's the, it's the most dangerous metal of the mind. It gives the mind way. That's how the mercury looks. It's actually, you know, it's like water. And uh, this is, this is the, the metallic mercury. And by definition, this one really caught me how this in the Greek mythology, you know, it's actually a very notorious element. And chemically speaking, as my friend Chris gave an excellent talk on the, on the metal chemistry as well as the biochemistry and molecular biology, this is a very notorious metal. When we have these environmental health protection laws in our laboratories, even we use so many precautions, we are so much worried. I never ask my students to make methyl mercury. I'm 50 plus years old. On a Saturday morning, I go to the lab when nobody is there, and I make methyl mercury stock solutions. I tell them, please don't make, let me make it. So that much of, you know, because like Chris mentioned, inorganic mercury is so toxic even the mercury salts, and you just need a very little bit of concentration as compared to methyl mercury. When we treat these cells and our organs, we also work on explanted vascular tissues to look at the contractions. 
So the, that's the reason why I wanted to show this is a very notorious metal. And again, my previous speakers mentioned about what happens to the biotransformation of this metal. And it's converted to methyl mercury in the body. And that is really, really the most dangerous one because it passes through the barriers and the membranes and does a lot of you know, havoc in the cells and tissues. The most interesting point I would like to make here is we are interested in mechanisms. The mechanisms, the early on, what actually triggers these toxic phenomena in the cells. So these mechanisms that lead to further you know, genetic disturbances in the cell or physiological disturbances in the cell. So we look at the early on signaling events. I'm also a signal transduction biologist, so we look at very early on signals what happened to these. And this one is mercury as a culturally, I have been also very much interested from my childhood because apart from other cultures, in Indian culture also, mercury has been used as an Ayurvedic med you know, medicinal drug even pregnant women were given red oxide of mercury, thinking that the babies would be born healthy. Even till now, mercury is in Ayurvedic medicine given for certain infections. In addition to that, mercury has been used as a fungicide in agriculture, and that has been a practice in, in the East, as well as you see some other countries like Iraq, to the big tragedy of mercury being used as a fungicide, and people used those grains, and the kids again got you know, hit by that. So one of the things, my father had a fungal infection when he was 65 plus, and he was given an antifungal. There is no antifungal antibiotic, you know. And one of the drugs is actually grisofulvin, it's called. It's actually a mercury-based drug. And he took that, that medication for at least two years. And he developed a disorder called, very similar to myasthenia gravis. And an involuntary movement of his jaws. And doctors couldn't say anything. They couldn't even know what happened. And he never even told that he was taking that medication. But finally, he, he died of that disorder. And I still believe very strongly that the mercury-containing antifungal medicine he took caused that problem. This is again a tragedy in Iraq. This is the Minamata Bay disease, what happened in Japan. And this one actually, when I was a student for environmental biology, I was always, I read books on this. It's, it's a horrific, horrifying tragedy. And what happens, this, these are the you know, results of human carelessness. That's what it looks like, you know. And I have seen some of my Japanese friends' relatives you know, having, still having these kind of problems after this minimum exposure. And these are the outbreaks historically. You know, we, we can enjoy, you look at and read intellectually, say, oh, these were the outbreaks. And here, ongoing 2001, we don't have any, for example, you are all talking about how can we put a registry of dental amalgam toxicities from mercury or thimerosal toxicities, toxicities you know, there is so much of debate. Four or five publications, every time I write, thimerosal has been implicated in autism. I get an underline from the reviewer. You have to refer to this paper so and so that it is still contradictory. And I have, I'm, my hand has been bent every time to include that sentence, that thimerosal is still, there is a controversy in thimerosal that it causes autism. It bothers me sometimes when my scientific freedom has been taken away. And I can quote both, but I can, I can think of what actually happens and put it there, at least speculate. And this is a podium I can just express that. I'm sorry, and I may be forgiven for that. The reason here is these are the cases that we need. This is the data where we have to fill in that what is actually happening with thimerosal, with amalgam mercury toxicity, and all those things. That's very critical. Again, you know, the environmental sources of mercury, just not dental amalgams, just, just not thimerosal. Actually, this is the biggest problem in the coal burning operations. When I went to South Africa, a few scientists I met, they asked me, they told me that in South Africa, especially in Cape Town, there are so many coal-fired thermal uh, power plants, and they think that they actually release a lot of mercury into the environment. 
This is just in the I don't have to go to Cape Town. Just look at, look at the United States. Live in the region I live here. Even, even some of the Canadian coal-fired coal power plant air actually contaminates that. And you see the burden of mercury. These are the regions where you, you are exposed to so much of mercury in the air, in, in addition to other transition elements. Okay, and I've said about mercury and its toxicity, where it stands in, in, in the literature and how, in what conditions it has been shown to be toxic. This is what the signal transduction network in the cells. This was about 10 years ago taken, and now it, you, can, you can add 100 more um, uh, pathways to this, and it becomes more complicated. And cells, the very acute response that cells undergo, they respond to these toxic insults and, and do these signal transductions. That, as Chris said, the switches. And these switches go haywire. And then they send signals. And these signals are transmitted in the cell in response to any insult, especially to these toxic metal insults. And then they modulate the behavior of the cells. One of those things that is very important is the cell membrane. I call it the gateway of the cell. The cell membrane sees anything. The membrane of the cell sees anything that goes through the cell first. That is the primary target. And then the cell membrane is not just a barrier. It's a very highly physiologically functional part of the cell. This is a phospholipid backbone with a number of proteins in it. Each one, there are so many thousands and thousands of switches in that. We only know about 0.001% of that. And these membranes, when they react to a stimulus, whether a toxic or a beneficial or a hormonal, and then it sends signals. It's a receiver and a transducer. It is just like a chip. It's a living chip. It does very fascinating things. And this is the gateway of the cell. So mercury sits on it, or lead sits on it, cadmium sits on it, or estrogen sits on it, and then membrane responds. So the membranes are very important, just like your house. You have a beautiful house. If your walls are not good, the house is gone. So that's why you have to be worried about the walls, the sidings, the plaster, the cement, the bricks, the wood, everything. That's the same thing. You got to have a scaffolding. Membranes have scaffolding. The scaffolding comes from the cytoskeleton. The membranes have also a skeleton just like your muscle. That's called a cytoskeleton, called cell skeleton. The nucleus, a cell within the cell. A nucleus is not nucleus. The modern, the current concept of a nucleus is a cell within the cell. It is an autonomous body, but dependent upon the rest of the cell. Again, it functions autonomously, but depends upon the functions of the cell, just like mitochondrion. The mitochondrion is also a cell within the cell. The same way the nucleus has its own skeleton, it's called nucleoskeleton. We are working on that a little bit. The same way the mitochondria has its own skeleton, it's called a mitochondrial skeleton or mitoskeleton. So nevertheless, the cell skeleton, that's called the cytoskeleton, is very similar to a muscle. It has a contractile apparatus. It contracts, it relaxes, it moves. So a cell has to move. An attached cell, don't think like the reason I'm going, I'm saying these things is because even an attached adherent cell moves. So the movement, its shape, its physical nature is regulated by the cytoskeleton or the cell skeleton, which is similar to a muscle. This is what a lipid bilayer, you probably read this in your intermediate or, or, or freshman class, a cell membrane is a lipid bilayer with phospholipids. They're very important because they not only give you a barrier property to the cell, but they're also functionally very important because they have all the lipids. And these lipids are for functional purposes, for structural purposes, and just as Chris said, for inflammation regulation, because they contain a fatty acid called arachidonic acid that is released from the membrane and is converted into prostaglandins and leukotrienes. And when you take aspirin to combat the headache or a muscle ache, 
That's what the aspirin does. It just blocks the formation of prostaglandin from the cyclooxygenases, and your inflammation is stopped. So what happens when you hit with transition elements, these membranes respond, and the phospholipid and hydrolyzing or breaking enzymes get activated, like these phospholipases. There are four kinds of phospholipases. The second one is the arachidonic acid releasing one called PLA2 that releases arachidonic acid that is converted to prostaglandins, which causes inflammation. So when you look at inflammation by these transition metals, by these heavy metals, you also look at what happens to the membrane-derived inf inflammatory compounds like prostaglandins and leukotrienes. It's very critical. This is what happens. These prostaglandins are formed and leukotrienes are formed. They cause inflammation and other, other things. The reason why they are in the body is to regulate. If the balance is tipped off, these cause a, a lot of disturbances in the cell, these prostaglandins. So that's what happens. So previously what we did, the, the reason I was showing, the earlier work we did, we were interested what happens to these lipid signal mediators in the cell when these cells, especially vascular cells, see a toxic metal like mercury. Nothing was known till then. So we were interested to look at what happens to the dynamics of these lipids in the membranes these membranes have at least 800 different types of lipids. Out of these 800 different types of lipids, we were only interested in a couple of them, how they are actually altered by mercury, and they cause the damage to the vascular cell. Now coming to the vasculature. Heart is nothing but a modified blood vessel, if you look at it that way. I teach my kids that way. All the blood vessels come from heart, but if you look at heart, it is nothing but a big modified aortic vessel. It has its own endothelium, epicardial endothelium. Nothing is known about it. I'll tell you why endothelium is so important and what is endothelium. Same way, the blood vessel, the blood supply that is actually carried out by both veins. Veins contain more blood and arteries, and the veins also have endothelium. Nothing is known about how the venous always you know, we scientists and we physicians ignore the venous endothelium. We always are interested in looking at what happens to the arterial endothelium. And this is another, another question. So anyway, the, the blood vessels play a major crucial role in the physiological regulations of the body. Cerebral blood vessels, the cerebral mi microvasculature, the stroke, stroke phenomenon, regulation of blood supply to the brain, Blood-brain barrier regulation. All these things are regulated by the blood vessels. Oxygen, nutrient delivery. So th this is how the blood vessels are important. Now if you look at anatomically, little more details into the blood vessel, you can see one interesting lining of the cells inside the lumen of the blood vessel, say either the artery or the vein. One single cell thick lining, just one single cell thick lining. It's like a just one single cell thick membrane surrounds the lumen of the blood vessel. That is a monolayer of endothelium. That single monolayer of endothelium plays a dramatic role in the regulation of the blood vessels or cardiovascular function. Because it is an organ. It is not a cell. It is not a cell monolayer. The, con the current understanding of endothelium is this is an organ. So what, what does it do? It actually regulates the ionic balance. It regulates the growth. All the angiogenesis, all the new blood vessels should come from endothelium, pre-existing endothelium. And also it regulates the contraction of the blood vessel. The endothelium has a very important property. It makes nitric oxide, the gaseous hormone, by the action of endothelial nitric oxide synthase. And that nitric oxide from the endothelium goes into the smooth muscle and regulates the vasodilation. If endothelium is ruptured or endothelium becomes dysfunctional or there is an impairment in the endothelium due to some insult, similar to a mercury insult, the vessel will not function properly. It will not actually dilate properly or contract properly. So, so far what we have done in, in, in the past, 
we were just understanding what happens to the membrane phospholipid signaling molecules, how mercury attacks them, how mercury actually modulates those enzymes and ultimately leads to the toxicity of mercury. And we showed that earlier that phospholipase D, one of those lipid hydrolyzing enzymes in the membranes is activated. It makes a signal molecule called phosphatidic acid. Phosphatidic acid causes cytotoxicity in the cells of blood vessel. Those are endothelial cells. We continued and worked on work further, and we had shown that in this different pathway, it also activates phospholipase A2 and causes arachidonic acid metabolites like prostaglandins and leukotrienes. These are inflammatory substances, and they actually cause damage to the blood vessel endothelium. And then we also showed one of the interesting things that mercury does, it does a number of things. And one of the things it does is it actually raises cellular, cellular calcium. That, that also goes through your thiol redox. Immediately it attacks thiol redox and calcium uptake. And also intracellular calcium levels also go up. So when the cell calcium is up, it's called a calcium paradox. Calcium is a good guy, calcium is a bad guy. But you have to control the person. It's like a wild horse. Until it is tamed, it has to be in chains. The same way, calcium has to be regulated all the time. It's a calcium paradox. Still today, it's not understood completely how calcium plays a major role in myocardial problems. Similarly, vitamin C, it's called a vitamin C paradox. Vitamin C is good, vitamin C is bad. Oxygen, oxygen is a fair paradox. Oxygen is good, oxygen is bad. It's same way, calcium. So when calcium goes up due to action of mercury in vascular endothelium, it triggers all sorts of enzyme activities. It activates proteases, it activates phospholipases. Once these are activated, they destroy the membrane and other organelles. So you can control that. So we had shown this, that if you take calcium antagonist, you can protect mercury toxicity. Okay, like diltiazem, nifedipine, nimodipine, all these calcium antagonists, if you give to the mercury uh, treated cells or mercury treated organs, you can actually protect it from the toxic action of mercury. So that showed us that in even cells don't have voltage get, uh, gated calcium channels, you can also protect it with the calcium antagonists. So we had shown this, that calcium also plays a major role. Then we asked a question now is, what exactly happens to the cell skeleton? Does mercury act on cell skeleton also, or cytoskeleton? Does it cause any changes in the cytoskeleton? Does it cause changes to the biophysical nature of the cell? Does it some way impair the angiogenesis or the function of the blood, ves blood vessel inner lining? Th these were the new questions that we started asking. Again, we went back to the vascular endothelium. We took the model, endothelial monolayer model, and started asking these questions. So again, this is an outline showing the in inside of the vasculature, a single monolayer of, of cells, the endothelial monolayer. Before I go, just I want to take an excursion to what sulfur, role of sulfur that is playing a major role in biological systems. It's very interesting that during evolution, the living systems have chosen sulfur as a major player in electron reshuffling. If you go back, the models are still existing if you go to thermal springs, you still have sulfur bacteria, and they still utilize them even in the oxygen-rich environments to derive their energy from sulfur-containing compounds. So it's called anoxygenic metabolism or anoxygenic bioenergetics. That means making energy from sulfur in the absence of oxygen. And then that's how the sulfur has been utilized in, as an electron donor and in, in your metabolism pathways. And when you take either the photosynthesis in plants or you take respiration in all the living systems, having mitochondria, you can see that sulfur plays a major role in the redox. And this one is, I just I want to show you, this is a, just a classroom chart of a redox potential. Anyway, to tell you in a nutshell, there is there are terminal, several electron acceptors in the biological systems. Depending on each system, each system utilizes a different one. 
in the energetics or making energy. The most important ones are the cysteine and methionine. Okay, it's a, the reason is the sulfur has been chosen because it's a very strong hydrogen bond or donor acceptor, and also it's a very good metal ligand. That's one of the nature's marvels. And there is another amino acid called methionine, which is also a sulfur-containing amino acid. Not much is known about it with respect to metal ion binding, metal ion partic participation in the metal ion biochemistry. But now, this methionine plays a major role in the RNA uh, metabolism and other things. So it's also very important, a sulfur-containing amino acid. Now going back to the sulfur and sulfur-containing amino acid, cysteine, this is what, my, this, uh, what exactly my earlier speakers talked about, is the glorthione. This is actually called a soluble thiol, or soluble means it is present in the cytosol. And this one actually is the most important thiol redox element in the body. This regulates most of the th redox functions in the cell. One thing that always we forget to emphasize is on non-glorothione redoxes. That means your cell proteins are also rich in cysteine. They have a sulfhydryl moiety there. And these proteins that contain cysteine are also very highly active in redox biochemistry. So what glorothione actually does, it repairs these cysteine-containing proteins. So they are also attacked. For example, the metallothionin, which has got, which is 10,000 kilodal protein, which has got about 80% cysteines in it. So when a, per, a system is insulted by a, a heavy metal, it quickly starts making metallothionin. So that's a response. It's an adaptive response. That metallothionin, its function is to bind to trans-trace heavy metal and then sequester them and keep them in a place. Okay, but nevertheless, when the balance is actually when you have more and more and more heavy metals, the cell loses the capacity of making enough metallothionin, and then the cell gives up. So that's what the, the primary function of these metal binding proteins with very high cysteine concentration, they actually do participate in in metal homeostasis. That's what happens to zinc. Pregnant woman has very high levels of metallothionin because zinc is needed for brain development. So the maternal zinc is transported to the fetus through metallothionin. The metallothionin binds to the maternal zinc and the maternal zinc is taken to the brain in the fetus and the fetus develops without zinc the fetus won't develop normally. There are about 265 enzymes in the body till today known that are zinc-dependent enzymes. So that is the function of the metallothionin. So metallothionin has an affinity. It has a love for transitional metals like zinc, cadmium, lead, mercury, silver, and that's what it, that's what it does. It binds to them and then mobilizes them. It, so needless to say, the function of this this tripeptide is not only to maintain the redox, it also maintains the binding of metal ions and also the repair of sulfhydryl containing proteins. They're called vicinal thiols, which are often ignored. In most of the biochemistry, you hear people talking about only GSH, 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 the protein thiols, protein SH, protein SH, protein SH. My friend Chris mentioned about thioredoxin, that's actually thioredoxin and glutaredoxin, they actually, watch, actually what they do, they also repair the protein thiols, SHS in those. So these have to be concentrated more. So the functions of glutathione, I wanna quickly finish the functions of glutathione. What I, you've probably heard this several times in this symposium. They, one thing, they actually act as a cofactor in several enzymatic reactions. And also they conjugate to the drugs, making them water soluble like Chris mentioned about the phase two reactions. And the other one is, one of the most notable things is that glutathione also participates in reducing reactive oxygen species like peroxides. So my interest is in lipid peroxides. 
Membranes undergo peroxidation. They form hydroperoxides. These hydroperoxides are taken care by an enzyme called glutathione peroxidase, which utilizes glutathione as a cofactor and reduces them. In turn, it also protects the macromolecules in the nucleus, like DNA and RNA and proteins, and ultimately protects from cell death. That is the reason why your thiol redox status, especially the glutathione as well as protein thiol redox status, is very, very important. It's very crucial, especially when you're talking about metal insult, like mercury insult. And it is very, very complex and complicated to save a cell or a tissue or an organism when it is attacked by transition metals like mercury. And when glutathione is oxidized, actually it forms a disulfide. This is one of the conventional ways of telling, showing the oxidation of glutathione. This will be re repaired by glutathione reductase and other things, and it goes back to glutathione again. But one of the problems in oxidation chemistry with glutathione is, without, in, in, instead of forming a disulfide and, and getting it again recycled back to glutathione, the cysteine will undergo oxidation to for the glutathione will undergo oxidation to form thiol radicals. That means the SH will undergo a radical attack to form radicals at the, thi at the thiol SH. And once the thiol radicals are formed, and it is very difficult again to, to repair it back. So one has to be careful how to recycle these back to normal glutathione. Okay. This is what I mentioned earlier, is the protein thiols are very important in addition to glutathione. And these thiols in proteins dictate the structure and function of proteins, including enzymes. So in other words, the protein thiols are also repaired by glutathione. Okay, when the SH is lost, again, glutathione donates back and, and keeps them in shape. So when you take vascular endothelial cells and expose to methyl mercury, this is in about 30 minutes. It's a low dose of even you know, 25 micromolar of a mercury chloride we compared when we took methyl mercury, it caused almost 50% loss of cellular glutathione. This is within 30 minutes. And by the time already we started seeing morphological changes, and you can see that. This was published paper, just I wanted to show you here what happens to the morphology. It shrinks, and we, even we have the electron micrographic pictures showing this nanotube formation. Several cells shrink in size. They try to communicate. They really struggle a lot. When I see these cells, I can understand how people struggle when they have mercury intoxication problems. Within minutes, they really literally struggle. So the acute response, we don't know. When a patient comes to you, I don't know after, a, after how many days the patient comes to you being exposed to mercury. The initial response is, I don't know. Nobody catches them. That's what the initial acute signaling. Cell signaling is the most important. And what happens is, first, it actually sends the message. It labels it on the day one you're exposed to mercury. It labels it, OK, you got to go this way. Even if you remove mercury, the signal is still going on. It is like a dove taking the message, dropping the message at your doorstep. You read it, dove is gone. So you remove the mercury. But still, once mercury hits the cell, sets the signal, even if you try to detoxify it, of course, it's very difficult to remove, in my opinion, mercury that's already bound very tightly to certain protein ligands in the cell. But try to detoxify, remove from mercury exposure. The message is already there. The signal transducing message is already there. It's just going. So this is what it is. So then you need to think about how you're going to repair the cell, how you're going to intervene those signals. You know, once the bad message is sent, you already know the message has been sent. You know that mercury has been removed. Now you have to think about how I'm going to rescue at this stage. So that's what happens in signal transduction. We are now trying to see post-insult rescuing. You treat it and then remove mercury and try to rescue it. How you are going to rescue? Not in presence of mercury. Treat, give a challenge, give a pulse, remove it, and see what happens. So that's where we are looking at what kind of signals are there, how the signals are going, and where you can intervene, and what are the modulations of those in terms of cellular response. So for example, we want to look at cytotoxicity. It's a very simple one. 
We don't do rocket science. We just want to see how cell responds, what is happening at the membrane level, where the membrane gets damaged. Once the membrane gets damaged, the cellular contents are going to be leaked out. And we trap one of those enzymes called lactate dehydrogenase. This is within two hours of treatment when you treat with methylmercury. Okay, you can see that how much of this is a phenomenal increase in the release of the enzyme in a dose-dependent manner. And then you go for another couple of more, another hour, in three hours, the magnitude increases. It's still releasing the enzyme. Still mercury is present. And now, you can look at thimerosal. The previous ones was, was, was methylmercury, and this one is thimerosal. You can see thimerosal is also doing, for some reason, thimerosal activation is a little slower than methylmercury. But once it takes off, this is phenomenal increase. And that's what happens with thimerosal. We're still trying to understand what actually goes on with thimerosal. You can, for four hours with thimerosal, even at a concentration around 25 micromolar, which is a really small concentration compared to what is present in, in your you know, um, pharmaceuticals. And uh, this is actually very high cellular damage. Look at mitochondrial function. We also look at the toxicity in terms of mitochondrial function, how the cellular mitochondria are affected, because the bioenergetics are so important. If mitochondria are shut down, the repair of the cell or the survival of the cell is going to be very difficult. So we look at a reductase called MTT reduction, and the MTT reduction is down even within two hours with methylmercury. Go and look at, again, four hours. It's much more lower, almost. It's going back to the basal level, the MTT reduction. The, num the um, lowering of the histogram shows you that the mitochondrial function is down. If you go and look at this, this one is, again, five hours we went with methylmercury and looked at. It's, again, even at the lowest concentration, it is starting exhibiting the mitochondrial damage. And when you look at the thimerosal now, you can see thimerosal is much worse when you compare it. So the targets from spe species to species mercury, the targets are all different too. For methylmercury, some targets may be exhibiting response very quickly. And for thimerosal, some targets are going to expand, uh, uh, respond you know, towards a greater extent. In this case, the mitochondrial respiration is is the worst target of thimerosal attack. So therefore, where does this toxicity lead? We have shown that the phospholipids are targets. We have shown that the cell morphology is changing and the cytoskel, the, the, the enzymes are coming leaking, the membrane is damaged. So what is happening? Where does it lead to? So we asked a question here, so what should we do further now to look at this? One of the things that always strikes us is the monolayer. The, as I mentioned earlier, the endothelium is a single cell thick monolayer in the lumen of the blood vessel. There are tight junctions. If these tight junctions are altered, they are like this. They are called, when you culture these cells in a petri dish, we call them cobblestone morphology. That means they are like cobblestones. They are like bricks layered like next to each other, very tight. Any disturbance will cause a gap between the two cells. If the gap is, is there staying for longer time, the macromolecules from the blood will go through these gaps. They're called paracellular gaps. And the neutrophils and leukocytes will go through those gaps, and the phenomenon is called diapedesis. Some of you might have remembered from your early hematology courses or immunology courses, the diapedesis of the neutrophils or leukocytes, through these gaps, they go into the interstitium. Once the macromolecules leak and the leukocytes go through the paracellular gaps, diapedesis or extravasation into the interstitium, that is the drama. That is the inflammation, the edema. It's called a vascular leak phenomenon. So this is, the, this is what we are interested. Why these cells, how these cells fall apart? 
making a paracellular gap so wide, and these macromolecules go through, causing edema and also diapedesis and infiltration of leukocytes, causing inflammation. Once leukocytes go into the interstitium, you all know I don't have to tell the story. It's inflammation. That's what happens in vascular leak. Again, since I am working in a lung division, I have to work on lung, so I work on the pulmonary vascular leak. Not only that, I'm also interested in blood-brain barrier and other things, so we see a lot of interesting things. When Chris mentioned about inhalation of mercury, people should be very careful about what happens to the pulmonary vasculature. It, because I'm really worried about long-term effects of the vasculature, because that's what it dictates most of the things. That's a very nice point, actually. So this, what actually regulates this, this cobblestone morphology, this tightness in these, in these membranes, how these mem cells tightly attach to each other in a monolayer. It's not like a cancer tissue. It's not like a skin tissue that these epithelial cells mount on each other. And there is a mountain of these. It's a same, nature has created a marvelous endothelium to maintain a monolayer. There is a contact inhibition. The phenomenon is called contact inhibition. The contact inhibition is that once they form a monolayer, they, won't, they stop growing. They don't grow anymore. They don't divide. That's called contact inhibition. That's such a marvelous system that is. So how that is regulated? That's regulated by the, type, by the cytoskeleton. This is a cartoon of these cytoskeletons. So you can see the complexity here. This is one cell. This is another cell. You can see these proteins. There is an actin here. The actin, very similar to muscle actin, very similar to muscle actin. This actin regulates it. Normally in this cell, the actin is in globular actin. It's like a globule. When it has a stress, it becomes filamentous. It's called F actin. When it is filamentous, it stretches the cell. And the cell starts stretching and shrinking and starting changing in morphology. And when that morphology changes, you have these paracellular gaps. And the, through these gaps, all the drama happens. So this is how it looks. You see these proteins, and these are the apical layer. This is the basal side of the cell. You can see these proteins. I don't want to go in deep into proteins. I just wanted to show the complexity of these. The reason these proteins I show, these are all redox-sensitive proteins. Redox hyphen sensitive proteins. That means they have very high SH groups in them. That means they are the targets for heavy metals like mercury. That means they are the targets for oxidative stress. That means they undergo changes, they undergo damage. Repairing those is a headache. I'll tell you, we have a headache. I'll show some slides here. It's repairing them. Once the mercury binds to those, I don't know how to remove them. And we're trying to look at the sulfide redox of those elements. We're trying to isolate them and look at those, but we have to be careful. Once you lose that contractility, and back in contraction as well as ex expansion of the cytoskeleton in the endothelium of blood vessel, then you have to think of what's happening to my vasculature. Once the plumbing is, if you go to your cardiologist, you will say, you will talk everything about plumbing. He won't talk about heart. Even if he runs you, puts you on treadmill, uh, treadmill even if he puts you everything, he will ask you, what is your triglyceride level? A short break. What's your cholesterol level? Why are you asking this? Heart has nothing to do with cholesterol. You cannot damage heart unless there is a congenital disease. Heart tissue is very tough. I'll give one example here. Heart mitochondria can withstand up to one millimolar hydrogen peroxide. Isolated heart mitochondria, isolated liver mitochondria, we take both. And we were studying hydrogen peroxide induced oxidative stress. Liver mitochondria, 100 micromolar hydrogen peroxide will kill them. Whereas heart mitochondria, we keep on adding my H2O2, nothing happens. So heart is a very tough tissue. The whole problem is vasculature. Whole problem is endothelium. So we have to be careful in the sense looking at as a scientist, I'm not a doctor or anything, but I, what I'm careful is looking at what happens to the vasculature and vascular endothelium. So going back to the story from the excursion is what happens to these cytoskeletal elements, these proteins, which are redox sensitive proteins, which are very high sulfhydrals, they are the targets for oxidative attack. They are the targets for heavy metal attack and you have to protect them. Their glorothion plays a role, but it rejuvenates them, sulfidal, other sulfidal compounds, they rejuvenate these thiol-rich proteins. This is what happens. 
This is what happens, how the cell moves. There are so many signaling cascades. These are all switches, as Chris mentioned. These switches respond. These are, again, redox-sensitive switches. And the cells change the shape. They're like worms. If you have seen these worms moving, they just move like that. I wish I brought a, a, a video live micrography with this to show you, but they move like that. There's a contraction. There is a relaxation with the actin. The cells move from here to there. Then you may ask me a question, why do the cells have to move? Normally, these cells have to move for angiogenesis, wound healing. So these endothelial cells keep on moving. And they not only form paracellular gaps, they also keep on moving. The movement is also restricted. Sometimes what happens to you when you hit with heavy metal, the movement is also hindered, and the cells don't move normally, and you don't have right wound healing. That means you don't have right angiogenesis. In addition to not having a normal contraction and relaxa relaxation of a blood vessel due to impaired nitric oxide synthesis. Okay, this is again a cartoon. I just want to show you this. I want to show you how the cytoskeleton actually regulates the movement of these cells. There are feet, and these feet are called lamellipodia. Podia means feet. Podium is foot. So these cells generate feet whenever they want. And when you hit with mercury, they will actually generate different feet in different directions. They lose their directionality. They don't know where they're moving. And they create these irregular feet formation, and they start creeping this way, that way, forming huge gaps. So when the monolayer endothelium, one single cell thick endothelium monolayer, when you hit with mercury or oxidative stress, the feet are formed all over the place, and they run all over the place. There is no directionality. They lose their coordination. That's what I wanted to show it here. And this is the paracellular gap formation, what happens here. And this is the leakage pathway. And what exactly happens for this alteration in the cell membrane at the cytoskeletal level? This is what happens. A normal cell is like this. When you hit with methylmercury, there is enormous formation of actin polymerization. This is called stress fibers. Literally, they are called stress fibers in literature. The cells from the globular actin, when you hit with mercury, they make stress fibers. And the stress fibers are formed. This is a confocal microscopy with phalloidin staining, which actually takes about two days to do this. And then when you hit with a chelating agent like EDTA, this is a millimolar level. Remember the dose. We have to use a millimolar EDTA to arrest about 50% of stress fiber formation. OK, that's what methylmercury does. Methylmercury forms stress fibers, and the cells move wrap, you know, randomly here and there. Then if you do the same thing and use another chelating agent like D-pencilamine or N-acetylcysteine, which is a glorothion precursor, and again, these are again in millimolar concentrations, you can see the same. They inhibit, but again, you have to use very high levels of these chelating agents or redox protectants. This one again, you use the common classic DMSA, and you can also, this is also used at a millimolar dose. Again, you still see about 40% stress fibers still lingering there due to methylmercury attack in those cytoskeleton of vascular endothelial cells. What about thimerosal? Thimerosal, even 5 micromolar, does cell cytoskeletal alterations. This is within about a period of one hour because we want to see very early on. We don't want to wait for days. We want to see very early on what happens to these cytoskeletal elements in the vascular endothelial cells. Thimerosal does that. Again, forms stress fibers in these cells with, due to actin polymerization. If you look at this, again, thimerosal is prote protected by DMSA and also NSL cysteine. And the concentrations of DMSA and NSL cysteine are at least one millimolar, very high. You still get protection, but you have to use the high levels of those, those drugs. If you look at this one, again, thimerosal, you can see with depensilamine protecting it. But again, you can see some stress fibers lingering when you compare with methylmercury, whereas in control, there is no stress fiber. Now comes to the story. The story is we used a, a novel antioxidant here that has been synthesized by Dr. Boyd Haley. And we were interested in this is for two reasons. One is it is strongly hydrophobic. Second one is it has got a very good thiol redox, redox stabilizing property. And third one is it has got the metal binding property. 
So it has got three, three things in one shot we can let us see. It's a suitcase of three things that we can see in one shot. What is it? So when we looked at this, we, we took this compound. This is called OSR. And let me tell you one thing here. I have no interest in any of the commercial things with, attached with this product. You see, purely between Boyd and me, it is intellectual, and he has been a guru on actually teaching me how most of this redox chemistry. And when you compare, we compared with NSL-16, and we compared OSR, and we can see NSL-16 at the same dose of 50 micromolar hasn't done anything. It hasn't protected at all. Whereas OSR at 50 micromolar has offered almost complete protection of stress fiber formation in the cells that has been caused by methylmercury. Now we went and asked a question, okay, that's fine. So what does it do to the paracellular gaps that is caused by methylmercury? This actin polymerization and all those gap formation in these cells induced by mercury. So we used a system called, we have a system, I also do some biophysics work. We used a system to measure the physics of the cell. So we grow these cells on gold electrodes. And once you grow these, them on the gold electrodes, they're the, here, and then you subject them to to electrical current and then measure the resistance. And any decline in the resistance will tell you that there is alteration in the cell morphology and paracellular gaps are being formed. And before we do that, we also went and studied what exactly happens to cell morphology with a methylmercury treatment over time. And basically, when you treat with methylmercury over time, cells lose their morphology and all those tight junctions are gone. And when you treat with OSR, even at 10 micromolar, you can see the protection of the morphology. You can see these nanotube formation, huge gaps. They're all actually are protected, even at a concentration of 10 micromolar. At DMSA, you have to use one millimolar, whereas OSR, you use a 10 micromolar concentration. You can 10 times less, isn't it? And a 10 times less concentration still protects. And you can go still a little higher if you use 25 micromolar OSR, still offers better protection, whereas OSR alone doesn't do much. When you use higher concentration, 50 micromolar, you can still see the protection from these nanotube formation and huge gaps in the methylmercury treated cells. It means OSR has a protective effect in cytoskeletal reorganization caused by methylmercury in vascular endothelial cells. Is it true? Okay, let us test in another way and see whether it is true or whether it is believable. So we went back to the electrical resistance and we studied the resistance in these cells. When you add methylmercury, you lose the resistance here. See, it's dropping with concentration increase. That tells you that the monolayer tight junctions are lost with methylmercury. Then we took OSR alone and, and started looking at the monolayer tight junctions, OSR doesn't do anything, even at a concentration of 50 micromolar, which is very, very, very low compared to DMSA and NAC. And when you use now, so the clear one, if you use OSR, completely protects the monolayer disturbance. At a concentration of 50 micromolar, no exaggeration, I have used so many compounds, but especially redox stabilizing compounds, this was very much we said, well, hooray, this is actually doing, now we are measuring, we are looking at the stabilization of glorothione and other things, and we're looking at the glorothione metabolism by OSR and protection in methylmercury. And thanks to him, for, thanks to Dr. Boyd Haley for uh, providing the compound and all the scientific advice, and uh, this is going to be a nice project for us. And now, very quickly, I have five minutes, four minutes, I think, um, I got the, from the moderator the signal, I want to show what angiogenesis is angiogenesis is actually two types. From the pre-existing cells, they, if the angiogenesis comes from the angioblast, like stem cells of endothelial cells, that is called angiogenesis. From the pre-existing blood vessel, if that happens, that is called vasculogenesis. Either way, the blood vessel formation is very important, and the endothelium plays a major role. Endothelial cells actually come and they form these tubes, and the microvessels, or absolutely endothelial tubes. The capillaries are endothelial tubes. There is little or no smooth muscle present in a capillary. That is the definition when I teach my class. All capillaries are endothelial tubes. 
So this tube formation, novel blood vessel, novel capillary formation, new blood vessels arise from endothelial cells. So you have to be extremely careful that the endothelial health is very important. Okay. Now quickly, this is how they invade. And when retina, this is how we look at the vasculature in vivo, the formation of blood vessels. When you treat with methylmercury, even at one micromolar dose of methylmercury, completely gone. You don't have angiogenesis. Even in the presence of VEGF, even in the presence of VEGF, these are human cells. No angiogenesis. Even at a dose of 0 0.05 micromolar, we completely abort angiogenesis. This is how the, the tube formation looks like on matrigel. You can see a rich media means it contains VEGF, good tubes. You can see those. And with increasing mercury, finally here, done. One micromolar methyl mercury, there is no angiogenesis at all. So that you have dots and dots. Now we are actually finding out there is apoptosis actually. Cells are killed and there is a lifting off. The other interesting thing is mercury at this dose even stops the VEGF receptors. The receptor binding to the VEGF binding to the VEGF receptor is also inhibited by mercury. So the, the phenomenon is multi-targeted. Multi, uh, the other one is quickly, I want to show this slide and show the thimerosal and mercury chloride. Thimerosal is again a nasty compound causing inhibition of angiogenesis. Mercury chloride takes a little longer time and longer dose to, to inhibit at least 50% of the angiogenesis. Again, targets, type of the compound, cell permeability, time, all these things include. But nevertheless, mercury causes inhibition of angiogenesis that actually goes through the thiol redox Maybe the complexation, maybe regeneration, maybe health of the uh, thiol health of the cell system. We are actually looking at those things. Finally, leads to the impaired angiogenesis and vascular toxicity. It's actually a global problem. It's not just our problem. Mercury is a global problem in a multi-task, uh, multi-rooted uh, path, and uh, this is, this has to be you know, addressed. And you know, everything got a moral if you can only find it. And that's what it is. And I can't tell my kids and come to the, come to the lab. Don't worry, mercury is not toxic. So I, <laughs> no, I, I, I need to tell them what are the problems with that. I need to educate them. They are more educated. And I need to take a precaution. I tell them, listen, I have seen half of the life. I will make it for you. You do it. I, once in a while, I work in the lab also. I go there and tell at them. And yell at them, they're not wearing a lab coat. No. In summertime, they come with shorts and half sleeve shirts. I don't know who drops. Janet Wetterhen from Dartmouth College. She made diethyl mercury. Probably you heard the story. A drop of diethyl mercury fell on her hand. That's it. And she died. And a great scientist. And um, made me have to be careful that, that, that there is example there. And I don't understand why people can't see that. Finally, I had about 45 students worked on projects in the last eight years. Emily Steinhauer, who did a wonderful work on lipid turnover, I didn't present here. Lynn Sowers did most of the cytoskeletal work. And Nick Kifoffer did this biophysics on nanotube formation. Thanks to him, he's still working. And uh, Vivek Kupsami actually started this project a long time ago. Sainath Kota is working on signaling. And Krishna Velanki has done all the OSR work, and he's working like a you know, horse in the lab. And thanks to him, Valerie Siapala worked on the natural products. And uh, finally, Niladri Gupta, thanks to him for giving us advice on how to prepare these and Rao Madhipati and cyclooxygenase products. Finally, I thank the IOMT for all the help and uh, inviting me to give a talk. I hope I made some sense here today. And my division and my university and the Davis Heart and Lung Institute, thank you very much for your patience. <laughs>